A very good evening and welcome to another episode of South Africa Today and Beyond. This evening on the show, I'm joined by Catherine and she is a former Miss Earth, but also she does a lot of things. She's part of Lead SA and also she's a fellow from Yali as well. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you. You do quite a lot of stuff, I must say. Um, firstly, I think let's take our viewers into being Miss Earth. What does that involve? But also because, I mean, a lot of times, and as we're speaking quite briefly, People interact with Miss South Africa and other pageants before. But what is Miss, Miss Earth all about and how's, how is it different from other beauty pageants, if you will? So the Miss Earth is a leadership program and the idea behind it is to empower South African women to be more actively engaged and involved in climate and sustainability issues. So the young women who apply to be a part of the program actually have to do community service from an environmental and climate perspective. They go through extensive workshops, training, educational programs so that they can understand and come to grips with the where we're at when we're talking climate change, when we're talking water stewardship, when we're looking at the drought in South Africa, how is that sort of activated and impacted by climate change and a change in climate across the continent. So the program really is to empower women to be able to be pillars within their communities far beyond the Miss Earth South Africa program. So this year we focused specifically on waste and we ran an extensive campaign called Waste Stops With Me and we engaged with stakeholders such as the city of Joburg, Pick It Up and the idea was how do we make sure that there's not only a civil society that want to recycle and want to understand waste differently but what infrastructure is there from a city perspective because it's all okay if we go and we say we want to recycle but if there's no way to go and people don't understand the process of recycling or, or gathering their waste differently we're going to have a problem somewhere along that value chain and a part of that value chain is looking at corporate South Africa how are corporates and business actually engaging in the disposal of their waste more sustainably and in a manner that they are having less of an impact on the world that we live in. So we really have tried to make sure that these kinds of programs and the Miss Earth South Africa allows for a multi-layered approach when we're looking at issues that affect us in society. And waste is definitely one that is a huge problem. So we've really tried to make sure that we are engaging different levels. We're working with corporates. We're looking at how do people who work across a hotel chain like Toko Sun, how are they impacted across that value chain as an employer who is a receptionist? Can I bring my waste to work? Can I understand within the company is the waste being disposed of and what then happens thereafter. So they're very important issues that we tackle as part of this program. The young women are judged in accordance to the work that they do at a grassroots level as part of the program. Food security, looking at the education within schools that they do. And it really does boil down to the final group of young women that come to Johannesburg for the final leg of the program and the young women that get announced as our ambassadors are really young women who have worked hard on the ground and have seen successes and failures when it comes to community work but they all leave having understood the power that they can have within their community when we talk about challenges that relate directly to the environment. I mean it's a quite a very dynamic space and I can hear when you speak but I know, I mean, from being Miss Earth now, you sort of running the space as well in this sector, um, you, you, you're sort of into it. But now let's talk about the, the, the pageant itself, moving on to other African, um, um, other countries on the African continent. How has the response been also there? But also in terms of public-private partnerships within those, um, the governments of those particular countries, your Botswana's, as you said, your Namibia's as well, as well. How has the response been in those countries? You know, it's a... It's a step-by-step -step process. It's not an easy one, but the response has been unbelievable because there's no program like this that exists in those countries that we work with. For example, in Zambia, we have an unbelievable, very small group of young women who are involved in the program, and it's a much smaller operation and program versus the South African program that we run. However, those young women are invested in making sure that they impact their communities. And for us, the bigger vision is how do we create a network of young women across Africa who can network with each other, share different things and ultimately they're looking at 
entrepreneurial opportunities where they're building themselves within the space of renewable energy, biofuels, waste management, um, food security, and they're able to lean on and network with other young women across borders. And I think for us as a vision, that is the bigger picture. And when it comes to governments, it's a slow process. Not everyone understands it. And we have, there are a lot of issues that we have to tackle when we talk about these issues. Climate change and the environment are not always top of priority for many countries, even though in some countries where we work, we have physically seen climate change and we have physically seen how communities no longer live how they used to because they've had to adapt to a changing climate. There are no rains predictable mm. like they used to be 10 or 20 years ago. Food cannot be grown in certain climatic um, changes that they have seen uh, at a really community level. So all those things impact on people, but people don't always create the link between themselves and agriculture, themselves and water stewardship. So we see those issues as isolated. So we don't understand that as a, as a general member of society, we need to understand and we need to understand why it matters to us if the climate does increase by two degrees. Mm. And on top of being an environmental activist, Catherine, but you're also an international solidarity activist. And this brings us in essence to the topic of the discussion here on the show today. I mean, you know, last week on the show, we had um, Comrade Elmami from the Western Sahara Embassy discussing and also bringing into context the his historical perspectives of the issue of Western Sahara, an issue that you're very close to and that you sort of adopted. Maybe take us through when you first interacted with the issue. And I know probably because of the some of the climatic conditions that you have in the space where you find people of Western Sahara, the issues within the space that you work in and the Miss Earth pageant, and also the discussions around waste management, the climate, you know, uh, less predictable. I mean, they live in a desert, you know. So those issues, of course, I mean, you sort of bring what you've learned in that space and also into the space of international solidarity, particularly the issue of Western Sahara. So maybe take us through when first you interacted with the issue. Thank you for that. Uh, before I go right back to the beginning, I have to link this straight into climate justice. So the work that I do really relates to the people on the ground in the refugee camps that are being affected by climate change on a daily basis. And when we look at a few weeks ago, uh, there was the COP22 uh, climate conference that happened in Marrakesh. And you have this happening in Morocco, but ironically, just across the border, mm. the people of the Western Sahara are the most affected and most vulnerable people on our continent who are living climatic change. They see extensive rainfall drought um, and all extremes uh, from a weather perspective. And last year, this time, they saw flooding um, that they have never seen before. And 25,000 people were displaced by those floods in the Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria. So we talk about it already displaced people become it, it, even more displaced. displaced. Sure. You cannot understand the human atrocities that are happening. And my work and link from climate change has moved from a, the, looking at the human rights perspective and we get to a middle ground, which is climate justice. And for me, I, I nearly two years ago, um, found out for the first time about the Sahrawi people and about the Western Sahara because I received an invitation from Morocco to speak at a conference that was being hosted. However, on further investigation, the conference was being hosted in the illegally occupied territory of the Western Sahara in Dakhla. And to cut a long story really short, I was not able to attend the conference because the South African government said to me, if I did go, something happened to me, they would not be able to assist me or protect me or look after me. And when they said that to me, I'm just a, an activist and, and a, an entrepreneur who was invited to speak at a conference. When I realized that there's a, a, a bigger picture at play here, I had to do investigation. I had to look into the, the issue further. And I was asked if I would consider you know, on my own accord, going into the camps. And after weeks of really looking at many different angles, looking at all of the literature that is available, both pro-Moroccan, pro, -Moroccan, pro um, the Sahrawi people, looking at the different viewpoints, I did my own homework and I decided I had to go into the camps. So I went there for the first time nearly two years ago and I stayed amongst the Sahrawi people. I understood what, the, what was going on. I wanted to be in a, in a place where 
I don't only speak to you because somebody's told me about the situation or I've read a whole lot of literature that is available. I wanted to be able to tell you what I tell you because I've lived amongst these people. I have understood their plight and I've understood the tragic circumstances that four decades in they are still living under. Right, Catherine, take us through to those that some of us have never been in the camps. And I mean, you're correct to say, you know, sometimes we need to, we need to hear and see what the oppressor, the oppressed rather, is going through. First-hand experience is also quite important, but also it helps us tell their story, you know. And international solidarity, I mean, you can't separate that from sort of the genetic makeup of South Africa. Mm -hmm. When you see, the, when, you, when you read about the history of the liberation movements in South Africa, and also the role of African, of African countries that played. For example, we learn about how Nigeria, for example, had a special tax to fund the liberation movements. So when you have one African country occupying another African country, it's really, it's really a worse form of colonization, if you will. But maybe before we go for an ad break, quickly, Catherine, take us through some of the experiences, in particular, in the refugee camps. So this is the last colony of Africa. And this illegal occupation sees um, people who are living in tents in the middle of the desert in extreme weather conditions, both very hot and very cold, depending on the time of year. When I first went into the camps, the one thing that really shook me was the fact I arrived late in the night. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. And the first time I arrived in the camps, there was complete darkness. But each dwelling had a small little little opening where you could see light coming in. It may be candlelight or it may be a small solar lamp. Um, and when day broke a few hours later, and it was the first, within the first six or eight hours I was in the camp, the most unbelievable thing to see was that hope lives in those camps. It is palpable, you can taste it, you can feel it, you can smell it. The women in the camps are very powerful. And they are very much at the forefront of the movement within the camps. They're an unbelievable people who have decided that a peaceful resolution is their answer. And since 1991, when the, when the ceasefire happened, they have tried to look at peaceful resolutions for the Sahrawi people. 26 odd years later, they still have not received um, that peaceful resolution that is due to them. But because of the liberation struggle that we um, the liberation movements we have coming out of our own country. Mm. We see many comparisons and within the camps, when people find out that you're South African, they feel some kind of a connection to you. Let me pause you there quickly, Catherine. Sure. I'm really sorry. Let's go for a quick ad break. When we come back, I want us to really take this conversation forward. So let's quickly for an ad break and we'll come back with Catherine after the break. Welcome back from the ad break and in studio I'm still joined by Catherine, a former Miss Earth, but also environmental activist, but also an international solidarity, I mean international solidarity activist as well. Catherine, before the ad break, I mean you were still telling us about the, the situation in the refugee camps in Western Sahara and how basically you saw hope uh, when you're in the refugee camps. But let's continue the conversation from there in terms of the experience that you, you know, share with us the experience that uh, you, you had basically in the refugee camps. So being in the camps is not an easy thing, but you understand the plight of the people and their daily lives. This is their, this is their reality 24-7. It's not just for a period of time, this is their life. There are generations of people that have been born in the camps and the humble dwellings where they live, either in a tent or in a small um, dwelling that has been built within the camp, these people have less than nothing. From a materialistic perspective, they have nothing. However, the one thing that they do have, and the one thing that is very clear, is their, their, their hold on hope. Their hold that one day they will return home. You speak to people intergenerationally within the camps and you understand that the older people in the camps remember living in the Western Sahara. Mm. They remember having to flee the Western Sahara um, during the conflict time um, during 1975. And it's unbelievable that people have lived like this and we have allowed the situation to, to continue year after year, decade after decade. So for 41 years, these people have lived and have only known the confinements of this camp. Unfortunately, not everyone has moved past 1975 because their access and exposure to the world and how the world has moved forward is limited. You have young people in the camp who are very, 
they're very dedicated to ensuring that each and every day they get up and what they do is towards self-determination towards the freedom of the Western Sahara and they are actively engaged and involved with the young people who are still in the occupied territory in the Western Sahara and the stories that they will share with you of the human atrocities that are happening the human rights violations that are happening specifically in the occupied territory on a day-to-day -day basis is is inhumane and is unacceptable. So their lives, they have no water, there's no taps that you can just open. There is no electricity um, widely available throughout all the camps. There's a rollout now of basic electricity, but most people live just with solar panels if they've got within um, the area of where their tent is or where their dwelling is, and they use that to charge a light, to charge perhaps a cell phone. There's no formal sanitation system that works and their food is dropped by air by the World Food Program and they get seven ingredients every single month and that is rationed per family um, in accordance to how many members there are within that family and it is really unbelievable to think that these people are still living under these conditions in 2016 and understanding where we come from and how the international solidarity um, campaigns really put pressure on our own government. Absolutely. That is critically important. When people say to me, oh, but why? We've got so many problems here at home. Sure, we do. But if we have a larger vision of how are we going to move Africa forward, we need to unlock these human atrocities happening in Africa. We need to understand what the African narrative is. Because sitting at home in South Africa, we all have an opinion. But have we ever had an open and frank discussion about Nigeria and the challenges that Nigerians face, people in Djibouti, people in Tanzania, do we understand what it is that they face on a day-to-day -day basis? When you go out throughout Africa, and I've had the privilege of working in many parts of Africa, not nearly enough, but many parts, you understand that South Africa is seen as a haven. South Africa is seen as this iconic place um, that that really has championed moving forward and taking their people with them. That's not really what the situation is back at home. If we look at the challenges our people still face, but that narrative of hope and that narrative that we are a beacon of light, we need to take that with us. When I go into the camps now, and I was there last month, I go into the camps and somebody uh, will, I have people coming to where I'm staying because they believe Catherine Constantinides is in the camps and they have read what I've written and they have read um, different opinion pieces that that is a way that I can share their story when I'm back at home. And that gets back to them. That gives them some kind of motivation to continue fighting. And we have to make sure that as South Africans, um, in the position that we're in, that we do lend solidarity to the people of the Western Sahara, because this fight is our fight. And we can never, never move Africa forward economically as a viable um, player within the economic globe if we do not really address all, the, all of these uh, human atrocities and unfortunately the Western Sahara is only one of them but it is the one that does not get focused on it is the one that nobody knows of when you talk about the Western Sahara people are blown away they cannot believe that there's a 2800 long kilometer long wall in um, that part of the world the second longest wall in the world and it's here in Africa we don't even know about it. Mm. The fact that there are five million landmines on either side of that wall to keep the Sahrawis who are in the occupied territory in and those that are out, out. We need to open our minds and we really need to educate ourselves to what is actually going on beyond our borders. I mean, Catherine, you're raising an excellent point to say that the situation continues simply because I think the international community, but also within the African continent, is that we allow it to, um, yes. you know, Morocco can do what it wants to do or act with utter impunity because the international community is not responding. But I know you go to the camps back and forth quite a lot. What kind of work are you doing in, in the camps and how can people get involved in the work that you're doing as well? I think the most important thing that people can do because uh, very few people will say, okay, I'll go with you to the camps because I've tried that. <laughs> <laughs> the response isn't that great, but that's fine. Yeah. I will continue going to the camps. But what we need is for people to educate themselves I, we, through this conversation, have just scratched on the surface, but it is up to people to now go and Google. Go Google the berm, go Google the Western Sahara, 
understand the situation and then share information. When you're at a dinner table and there is a conversation on conflict or on, on violence, bring up this issue. I guarantee you, you're going to have people completely, their eyes wide open, trying to understand a situation that they weren't aware of. We need to educate ourselves and we need to share information. So through the work that I do, I've written opinion pieces. I continue to use my platforms on social media to share information. And that is, is a critically important thing. If I can share information and if people follow that information and reshare it, mm. that's critically important. The the work in the camps that I do is multi-layered. I do a lot of strategic work both with the youth organizations within the camp as well as with the Polisario Front and with many of the different ministries looking at the climate and environment, looking at water, looking at where are they um, from an international perspective. I've been invited to speak on behalf of the issue of the Western Sahara on many platforms. We need to make sure that we're talking one message and one consistent, um, focused, uh, streamlined message. So that kind of work gets done there. But also sharing and, and teaching Sahrawi people the power of the platforms that they do have, that they don't realize um, can tell their story when they are inside the camps. They may not have food, they not, may not be able to grow food because of the extreme heat. But the one thing that most people have is a mobile phone. And those that have a smartphone need to understand the opportunity to access that mobile phone to be able to share their story mm -hmm. and to connect with other activists around the world, to be able to connect with me and to see what I'm doing here in South Africa and to take that information back to their larger communities. There are five camps, so across the five camps, it's very much about strategic work and making making sure that we are strategically aligned in what we're doing inside and outside of the camps. And then just to, to give hope to the young women in the camps. I was with young women recently and to understand their struggles where they, don't under, they can't have a bigger vision of who they want to be and what they want to do because they have eight siblings at home that they need to find a way to feed. Mm -hmm. And they have one parent because one of their parents has passed away from a disease uh, that is not curable and they, they cannot look after them. So you see their daily challenges. They're very similar to the challenges that some of our people face in very, very impoverished areas. But we need to try to make sure we can do what we can and to share best practice when it comes to conflict, d dialogue, discussion, and how they can use different platforms to make sure that they are constantly moving forward. Sure, absolutely, Catherine. I mean, very briefly as we conclude, are there plans perhaps within the Miss Earth, um, I think, space to try and link the struggle for the Western Sahara people and the space in which you occupy, especially around the issue of climate justice. Are there plans to do that? So those are already in place in the sense of discussions. Here in South Africa, I host dinners um, throughout the year to really enlighten people on the issue of the Western Sahara and to open their eyes on the plight of the Sahrawi people. The issue of climate justice I will continue to champion because I've seen the climate justice um, or injustice rather, happening to the Sahrawi people. And I think that across our continent, we need to be more mindful of what we are told. When Morocco says they are going into a massive renewable energy development, where is that development? Who is involved? And is the exploitation of the Western Sahara part of that bigger plan? And when it is, which it is, we need to make sure that we're standing up and we're using the platforms of larger networks such as the Miss Earth South Africa Leadership Programme to make sure we're championing, enforcing pressure on Morocco and the corporates who are exploiting the natural resources within the Western Sahara. So Catherine, thank you so much for that. I know you said we've just scratched the surface and there's still a lot to learn. And I think it's quite important people need to educate themselves. We need to raise awareness about these issues, about Western Sahara being the last colony of the African continent, sadly being occupied by another African country. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll definitely be following you and the work that you do. And we hope that ITV maybe one day can come along with you to Western Sahara and also interface with the issue firsthand for itself. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much. And I look forward to that. <laughs> sure. That's all we have for you this evening. Thank you so much for joining.